it's embodied voice. Uh, I shall be introducing Ian in more detail later. Every year at this time, we join with the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institute to celebrate Shakespeare's birthday. And at this point, I'd like to thank Brisley for their hospitality, and in particular, Becky Souchard for her help in organizing this event. Later, we'll be drinking wine and eating cake, and I shall be asking the mayor to propose a toast to the memory of William Shakespeare. Councillor Rob Appleyard has a long and distinguished record of public service with the Bath and North East Somerset Council. The mayor's theme for the year is the roots and canopy of our city. And his charity is the Mayor of Bath's Relief Fund, which helps people in need in the city. So if you'd like to make a donation, donation to this charity, there will be a, a place at the back uh, at the end. Mr. Mayor, thank you for coming, and I'd like you to follow in the footsteps of your distinguished predecessors and address us. Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, well, firstly, I didn't really expect to see so many people here today, so that's uh, very nice. So uh, we're looking forward to certainly the, the, the talk this afternoon. And I was just trying to think what I could actually add to the event today. And so I went on to Google to see if I could find any little known facts about William Shakespeare. <laughs> there are none. There are none. <laughs> but in doing just a bit of looking at it, my experience with William Shakespeare was that uh, um, certainly through my school years, there was a love hate relationship. Because he said one of his books tended to be the subject of uh, preparation for exams and things like this. And once you get past that, you can actually understand that uh, there's a huge complexity of the of the work he done. And to do 38 plus was well, 38 plays, wasn't it? Plus loads of other bits and pieces as well. Um, in a relatively short time, because I think he he left us when he was about 52. And so to, to achieve that, and then I'm thinking, aren't we lucky to have such a distinguished um, author um, that is British and really is institutionalised uh, around the world? Um, and, it, it, and you just think of William Shakespeare as part of the fabric. I mean, lots of people come and go. I mean, modern day, you know, you've got your Lloyd Webbers and everything like this that make some contributions, but they make, they don't get anywhere near the acceptance and the recognition that William Shakespeare had done. Um, there was one little known fact I thought, and I I, just, I thought that he'd done he'd written his last three plays actually on the iPad. <laughs> yeah. I think that may stretch people's imagination a little bit, maybe a little bit in, incorrect. But what I'd like to say is that uh, thank you very much to the societies, particularly because to carry on and perpetuate the the recognition and the the love of the work that Shakespeare has actually given us is actually pretty special. And to have a very strong society in Bath is particularly good. And with and. I like the fact that obviously other organisations like Grizzly are joining and collaborating as well. One of, one of my pleasures in my role is to network people together and to understand where they can get benefit from. And it certainly seems like there's that working here very well today. So thank you very much for the uh, the invitation to address you today. As I said, not long speeches, because you're going to get the best bit now. Like that. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. It's a good job the iPad hadn't been invented, because if it had been, we'd have lost both plays, they wouldn't have been included in the first folio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our speaker today is Ian Gann, Professor of English Literature at the University of Bath Spa. 
He's also director of the Global Academy of Liberal Arts Universities and head of development for European projects. Ian is the editor of the first volume of the history of Oxford University Press and also the general editor of the works of Jonathan Swift. And one of Ian's uh, research interests is in the history of reading and publishing. So we're particularly pleased to welcome Ian today because this year is the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio. And I guess that if it were not for this particular publication, seven years after Shakespeare's death, the Bath Shakespeare Society would not exist and we wouldn't be here today. Ian, thank you for coming. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you all for coming. This is a, a great turnout. I, I feel that you must have looked at the different poster from the one that I was advertised on, but uh, there will be um, there will be some extracts of Shakespeare, but they will be somewhat fleeting because our focus today is very much on the container within which Shakespeare, or at least about half of the plays that we um, know uh, today, um, the container in which those plays came down to us. Um, also, there are a um, uh, few bits and pieces. We've got some colleagues, uh, speakers online, or uh, audience members online, so I need to occasionally look down the camera, um, and I can't stray too far from the microphone. Um, I have, which I'm afraid is, is not much use for those uh, uh, online, um, there is a handout, which you all have, a single page, which basically just summarises some of the key uh, individuals and uh, terms I will use. They're also on a slide, so um, uh, everybody should be able to follow along anyway. Um, I've also brought, and I see there's a, a copy at the back, um, a facsimile of the first folio, the Charlton Hinman facsimile, um, uh, which is, I snuck it out of our university library uh, so at some point the librarian SWAT team may arrive uh, to retrieve it, um, but I'm, I'm looking after it, I, I promise. Um, so, uh, as Peter said, 1623, I don't need to tell you about the dates for Shakespeare, you all know that 1623, Shakespeare, alas, uh, is no longer with us, he died in 1616. Um, but the first folio, and I'll explain why it's called first and why it's called folio in a moment. Um, the first folio appears in 1623. However, let's look at 1623 in a little bit more detail. So um, we don't know for certain how many works were printed in 1623. We just know that of the ones that survive in the libraries, of universities and major research collections across the world, 566 of them are dated to 1623, and 474 of those have a London imprint. So the first folio was at least one of 474 works to be printed uh, that we know of in London. Um, we also know, and I'll come back to this date, 8th of November, 1623, um, two individuals who you will hear a lot about today um, enter Shakespeare's comedies, histories and tragedies, not called the first folio, not called the collected works, but comedies, histories and tragedies in something called the Stationers Register. I'll explain a little bit more about that. And then in November, December, probably November, by the end of November, um, William Shakespeare's uh, comedies, histories and tragedies is, of course, published and you will be very familiar very, very familiar with that particular opening. Um, and uh, um, one thing actually, if, if, if you're at the end of this, cannot think of a single question, you can ask me why that layout is unusual. Because normally in the early modern period, the picture is on the left and the text is only on the right. So it is unusual, it's not unheard of, but it is unusual for the uh, image to be on the right. And we can talk a little bit about why that is uh, the case. But let's take a step back. 
This is about as contemporaneous a map of London as we have, 1611. Um, those of you who know London well um, will be able to orient yourselves very quickly. Um, but we are looking at what we consider today to be the city of London um, with, uh, you can see the walls from uh, the middle of Tower of London going round essentially uh, and just to the west of St Paul's. Westminster is off the screen. Thames uh, uh, um, uh, uh, curls round. Um, and in that space, and obviously you've got uh, Southwark um, at the, on the other side of the river, uh, where uh, um, uh, the theatre houses are, um, probably about 200,000 people live in that space. It's pretty, pretty crowded. Um, St Paul's Cathedral, I'll come back to because that, I mean, it's in there because it's a landmark, but also because it's very important as far as the book trade is concerned in London. So that is London. Let's think about people. So we have, shall we say, three groups of people. I've grouped them in two groups here, but I, I will uh, explain in a moment. But the editors of the first folio of Shakespeare's uh, um, Comedies, Histories and Tragedies um, are two former colleagues of his from his uh, uh, theatrical days. And then you have a group of printers and publishers. And I put at the very bottom there, Martin Drauschutz, uh, the engraver who obviously engraved the very uh, iconic image. Um, but he was essentially contracted out. He's not really part of this story, but I put him in there because he is a, a, a part of the production of the book, but his role was very uh, specific. The other names there, Aspley, Blount, Jaggard, the two Jaggards, Smethwick, those are critical. Without them, there would have been no first folio. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, who they were and uh, 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 why they're important in, uh, 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 well, over the next uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. This is a close-up of St Paul's, and as you can see, St Paul's looked rather different uh, as it does now. Obviously, this is before the Great Fire. Um, and you'll see, so all of you, the, the orientation is the same. So uh, those of you who've been to St Paul's, um, may well have approached it from the Ludgate Hill. Um, and if you walk round, it's rather different now, obviously, or, but some of the same streets, street, street layouts are much the same. You'll see where it says St Paul above the, uh, um, just to the top right of uh, St Paul's. That's what is sometimes called St Paul's Cross. It was a um, pulpit for public uh, sermons. And um, often sometimes called St Paul's Churchyard. And if we look from above, so you can see where we are at the moment, and you see that space up there, Paul's Cross Churchyard, the cross yard. Um, that, so in some ways the, the, the layout here, it is, it is quite cramped, you've all walked around St Paul's on the outskirts. Um, and one of the extraordinary things about the English book trade in Shakespeare's time, is that it's heart, so this is not just London's book trade, but the whole of the English book trade, its heart is in that top right quadrant. And to give you a flavor of that, every single one of those squares that is in white is a bookshop. So if you were fortunate enough to be a literate person in London in 1623, and have some money in your pocket. These aren't the only places you can buy books. There are other uh, um, uh, groups of, of, of bookshops, but this is absolutely the heart of uh, the book trade in uh, uh, 1620s London. Um, you'll also see, if you look at the scale, these aren't big. These are really very small. Um, and yes, some of the books obviously were stored there, but some of the books must have been stored elsewhere. And we do know of warehouses elsewhere. Um, but this, and those of you who do economic history or any uh, uh, business studies may, uh, um, may wish to sort of reflect on this clustering, generally speaking, 
I remember at school geography uh, um, talking about the shoe shops always clustering. Uh, um, I don't think we get so many clusterings of, of uh, uh, particular um, uh, retail outlets, but 1620s London, this was the this was the heart. If I go back, um, so St Paul's Cathedral, there's a kind of logic to why St Paul's Cathedral is the heart of the book trade in London. Uh, and has been for many centuries prior to uh, Shakespeare's, um, uh, the publication of this work. And you've got a very large number of highly literate uh, bookish people working uh, uh, for or with the uh, um, uh, St Paul's Cathedral and the various um, organisations that relate to that. As a result, if the book, if the heart of the book trade in London and in England essentially is in this space, particularly the top right, it makes sense that the primary craft body and trade body for uh, the book trade also appears in this area. And you'll see uh, bottom left of St Paul's, you will see uh, uh, Stationers Hall, and I come back to that. That's its first location, not quite where it is in the 1620s, so this is, um, but also some face under St Paul's. I don't know if any of you have been to the crypts in St Paul's, but there was a church, a parish church under St Paul's, um, and uh, and there's a heartbreaking story of what happens uh, um, during the Great Fire. But St Face under St Paul's is the parish church for the book trade. That had more book trade uh, memorials, booksellers, printers and so on than anywhere else in the whole of England and that effectively, that was where um, the trade would have its, uh, um, uh, would go for uh, uh, feast days and so on. But go forward. It's, so the Stationers Company, now this is, I did my PhD on this, so we could be here a while, um, but I'll try and give you the headlines. Um, so some of you may have heard of the Stationers Company, some of you may even be members of the Stationers Company. Stationers Company is one of the London livery companies, Goldsmiths Company, Grocers Com Company, and so on. Um, sometimes historians will call it a guild. Terminology is a little bit uh, uh, um, uh, imprecise in that way. Founded in 1403 by the city authorities, when it had oversight of essentially the whole of the book trade, except legal scribes, what we would now call scriveners, who had their own company. Um, 1557, they get a royal charter, which is really important for them particularly because that means they get oversight of printing. So prior to 1557, you could be a printer in London and it didn't matter which company you belonged to. No company had oversight of that uh, uh, technology. It was still a relatively new technology. And so the station company in 1557 gets essentially a near monopolistic uh, control of printing, national powers of search, and they established this thing called the Stationers Register, in which all members of the company can record their publishing rights. And by 1623, pretty much every printer, every bookseller, every bookbinder, every publisher in London was a member of the Stationers Company. So it is, uh, uh, it's both a, a, a sort of trade union, uh, also a, a, a kind of business association. You've got people there who are amongst the wealthiest in the trade, but every apprentice goes through it and so on. So it is an incredibly important body for the book trade. This is the present day Stationers Hall. It's not quite where it was in that uh, uh, first uh, picture. It's tucked away. If you go down Ludgate Hill and you will just see on your right hand side a little alleyway you go through and there it is this is uh, as rebuilt after the uh, great fire and um partially rebuilt um because of uh, uh, it was hit in the um the bombing of that area uh, during the second world war and the stationers hall holds this document it doesn't look terribly exciting to me it looks very exciting. but uh, and this is the stationers register um, and I'll come back to why that is important, but the headline is that if you were a um, member of the book trade and you wanted to publish a new work in London, you were, in most cases, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, you would go and enter that in this 
record. That record begins in 1557. It was maintained through to the 1920s. Its legal status has changed a lot of, uh, during that time. But we, it's, it's a very unusual anywhere in the world to have a record essentially of publication history all the way from uh, 1550 through to 1623. Okay, what about the book? So why is it called a folio? Well, it's called a folio because um, of its format. So booksellers uh, uh, in the uh, 1620s would um, distinguish books according to how many times you had to fold the sheet of paper to uh, make the book. And folio, and here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, so the folio is any page, I'll do this on screen as well, any page that you fold once. So you make uh, um, two pages or two leaves, four pages. That is a folio. If you fold it again, it becomes a quarter. You fold it again, it becomes an octavo. octavo. Duodecimo is complicated because it's twelve and so on. But but essentially, that's the uh, um, that's why it's called a folio. So it's it's just because it's folded. Uh, it, the, the pages in it are only folded once. It is therefore large. And because, as we all know, large books get associated with importance and heft. I mean, one of the things about this is that you don't carry this around casually. Uh, it is far too uh, weighty. And that idea of the weightiness, the literal weightiness, meaning some kind of metaphorical intellectual weightiness is important. Plays, generally speaking, in this period do not appear in folios. There are some exceptions. But generally speaking, a play text on its own is a quarto, which is much easier, more like a, a pamphlet, much more pocket size. Um, it has, again, and you can look at this later, there's one at the back, and as I said, there's one here. Um, the, most of it, obviously, is plays, um, but it starts with what um, scholars call paratext, things outside of the, the, the main text, which includes exactly what you'd expect of a hefty sort of important literary volume as this was being presented. So a dedication to the Earl of Pembroke, Lord Chamberlain, because of the uh, uh, the link to um, the theatre company, to the great variety of readers, which was essentially a preface marketing uh, uh, blurb signed by Hemings and Condal, and then commemorative poems, including the most famous one by Ben Johnson, but others, then a table of contents, and then a name of uh, principal uh, actors. Um, and then we have the 36 plays um, across almost 900 pages, ordered by genre, though there's a whole separate question about exactly how are those genres understood. The text is arranged in two columns, and I'll show you that in a moment. There are act divisions, sometimes scene divisions. There are no line numbers. Um, so it's not like uh, the kind of book that you would, the play text you would have read at school or, or at university. And that's the, on the left is the famous uh, title, um, table of contents, and I've just blown it up there so you can see the uh, the full list. Uh, and uh, um, there are 35 plays there, which is a number I'll come back to. Okay, that's the book. Talk about the syndicate, which is a very sinister name, but it's a, it's a, a way of thinking about the, the project uh, of publishing the first folio. And this is where the names come in. So we have John Hemming, Hemmings, his name appears in both forms in the first folio. So, um, and then Henry Condal and uh, colleagues of Shakespeare's, uh, um, members of the Chamberlain's Men, later, uh, sorry, King's Men should not be Lord's Men, that's a typo on my part. They signed the de dedication and to the great variety of readers. So their names are very much front and center. Uh, and you can see, if you look at the name of principal actors um, that's listed in the first folio, you can see their names uh, there. The other part of the syndicate are the printers and publishers. So we have the two Jaggards, Edward Blount, William Aspley, and John Smethwick. Um, William I, uh, Jaggard, you can see this on the handout, William Jaggard dies just before uh, the, um, uh, the book is finally published. Um, his son takes over. Um, William Jaggard is city printer. He's official printer to the City of London. Um, Blount is a 
publisher, bookseller. So all of these are publishers, but they some of them, Jagged has printing out, a printing house, the others do not. Um, Blount, Aspley and Smedek, all of them, as you'd expect, are members of the company. At this point, all of them are pretty senior in the company. Uh, and following Shakespeare's, uh, the publication, and there's no causal link particularly other than they have money, um, they become part of the company's executive body and Aspley and Smedek become masters of the company, the highest uh, possible. Uh, Okay, now this is probably the most complicated bit um, because this is partly about the history, the origins of what we consider to be copyright uh, in the uh, uh, Anglo-American world. So, uh, thirty. So the first is copies. So I'll, I'll, copies is the term used in the period to talk of, or refer to the right to publish. So it's only a, it's a trade specific term. You know, you wouldn't anyone outside of the book trade would not know this particular technical meaning. But essentially, um, you'll see members of the book trade talking about copies. Who has the copy for a particular work? Who has the publishing rights for that? Um, so 36 plays appear in the first phone, 35 only on the table of contents, which we'll come back to, um, of which 18 had been published before. So 18 had never been published. The syndicate, so those five men, owned copies, the rights, for eight of the plays already uh, of the 36. Blount and Isaac Jaggard then register the copies for 14 plays that had never been published before uh, in the register, and I'll come to that in a moment. But So we have eight they already own, 14 they've now bought. Nobody else has those rights. Um, we assume in getting those rights, and we can talk about that in the Q and A, um, they will have paid Hemmings and Condal or their colleagues for the manuscript. But there is no, there's no concept of royalties. Copyright in this period is purely trade. Not authors do not have any rights uh, um, understood under, as we understand it, under copyright. So you do the maths, and you realise that there are 14 plays that have somebody's somebody owns the rights to them and they need to be negotiated. Um, and any of you work in publishing, who do, if you ever do an anthology of, of, of poetry or a collection of, of previously, previously published works where the works are still in copyright, you know about, or if you've got images in a book or whatever, getting those rights is, is a complicated uh, um, task. And this is what uh, um, the, the syndicate do. And we know, and we only know this because of what we, we, we've we been able to painstakingly reconstruct the printing. There are no, there's no account books that survive. There's no letters from the syndicate. But we know that there were two sets of negotiations that were difficult. The first with, with a member of the book trade called Matthew Law, who owned some pretty popular plays, Richard II, uh, Henry the first part of Henry the fourth, second part not so popular, but first part definitely, and Richard the third. Those are plays that you really want in a collected work, and they were amongst the most popular plays to be uh, reprinted. And so Law probably struck a really hard bargain, um, and that slowed things down. And we know that there's a point where, when they're printing, they stop printing, they stop um, setting Richard the third and move on to something else because they're not sure they're going to get the rights for Richard the third. And then uh, somewhat less uh, uh, popular play, but uh, Henry Wally's um, owned the rights to Troilus and Cressida. Um, he, he didn't uh, um, strike a deal until actually the printing, the first few copies of the uh, first folio had come off the press. So that's why there are 35 plays on the table of contents, not 36. And so some copies, early copies, do not have Troilus and Cressida. Most do have toilets and cluster, but so as I said, that's the most complicated bit. But that, in some ways, is an extraordinary kind of feat of uh, uh, publishing energy to try and bring together all these different permissions in order to be able to uh, um, publish that uh, collection without um, being essentially um, uh, subject to internal 
punishment by the company for violating each other's rights. So it had to be done properly. And this, um, this is the entry from the 8th of November, 1623, where Blount and Jagged, you can see their names at the top right. I will show you the text in a moment. This is the entry where those uh, plays are, uh, uh, the new plays, the plays that have never been published before, are entered. And you'll see, I've just extracted it out, Master Blount, Isaac Jagged, entered for their copy under the hands of Master Dr. Worrell, Master Cole Warden, uh, Master William, Shakespeare's comedy, etc. So many of the said copies as not formally entered to other men. In other words, recognizing that there are other copies out there, and then the full list, and then a fee. A couple of things to point out here. First is under the hands of, and that means signed by. So any work that was entered into the stationer's register in um, this period required two sets of signatures on the manuscript before it could be published. The first, and this is where uh, Dr. Worrell comes in, uh, it needed to be approved by uh, a, a censor, who in this case was a um, probably pretty close to St. Paul's uh, Cathedral, who's late, later a prebendary. Um, he's a clergyman, and that's common. That's very, very common. Um, and then Master Cole, so you have to have that signed off, and then you have to have a sign off from within the company. And the company is not checking that the, the work is uh, acceptable in terms of its content, it's checking that nobody else owns the rights. It's a, a kind of official internal thing to say, yes, you're not violating anybody else's rights. So Cole is one of the senior officers of that time. He's also very friendly with uh, um, uh, Jagod's father, late father, uh, and uh, Blount and, and a couple of others of the, uh, uh, of the syndicate. So it's a small world. The other thing to point out here is that, as you like it, and Anthony and Cleopatra, and we've all been here, you know, it's complicated keeping track of paperwork. They discovered after they had entered this, but before they paid, after they entered this, they discovered that between them, they actually owned those two plays. They just had forgotten that they had ever entered them. They'd never printed them. So, um, so that's why you have uh, um, 16 plays here, but of uh, payment is actually for 14 because they discovered there were two that they already uh, um, had right. Okay, so that's the you know, some of the economics. I'll come back to uh, a little bit more of the economics a little later. So you've now got you've got your syndicate, you've got your texts, you've now got to produce this, and so you go into this, which is the the, the best. Although it's still inaccurate, that is not a terribly good printing press a representation. But you can see the typesetters and. You can see particularly the the piece the the, the printed sheets being hung uh, uh, to dry. Um, that is a, an early modern printing house. So, Agard's printing house because a printing house you need space, and so printing houses there are not many printing houses in St Paul's because it take up quite a bit of space. So his printing house and his city printer, so he's he's got a fairly large establishment. Um, it's on the corner of Aldersgate and uh, Barbican at the sign of the Half Eagle in Key. Um, he has two active printing presses, which makes him on the larger size of the London uh, book trade, tiny compared to the rest of Europe. If any of you have ever been to the Plantin Meratus Museum in uh, Antwerp, they have rooms with 10 printing presses, so uh, it's much, much smaller. Um, he's an official city printer, so he does a lot of, he prints for the mayor uh, uh, and the court of Alden. And that means all official documentation. Um, and um, I'm sure it's changed nowadays, but uh, evidently there would be sometimes a rush job. The mayor wanted something very quickly. And so a city printer, you're used to working very fast. So printing something like this is not urgent expensive and slow and it's not urgent so it probably took about almost two years to to print which is why you you know you do get those hiatuses as, as negotiations are going on um we know probably that there were nine different typesetters mm -hmm. the people who actually set the type and the reason we know that is not because we know their names although we can guess at some of them um but because we can analyze 
spelling preferences and the ways in which particular typesetters have particular uh, um, uh, ticks in terms of how they set uh, and, and spelled words. And we can identify uh, probably uh, at least nine. And it was um, set from a mixture of the plays that were already printed, which would then be marked up, and then those that uh, were had never been printed, which were set as manuscripts. Every copy of this, get very strong in that one, um, had, some didn't, but pretty much every copy had 227 sheets of paper, which is almost half a ream of paper. And as I've said, um, folio means folded in half. The folio, and this is not unusual for folios, um, rather than fold every page in half and then put them next to each other like that, so in sequence, actually what uh, um, happens with the first folio and all of other folios is that they were uh, um, folios in sixes, in which case the three sheets, and I'll hand these round so you can see how they uh, work, were uh, uh, interleaved and then folded together, and then the second set and so on. So I'm gonna, I'll just hand those round. I've got a couple of sets here. So there you go. And you see how they... um, And so those those little gatherings, choirs, um, there were eighty in uh, uh, the first folio. Now, those of you who are looking at this will see straight away that if you have to print pay the inner two pages of that choir, you need to be pretty sure where they're going to start and end, because you're not going to set each page in sequence. You're going to set them uh, by side of the sheet, and that's called casting off. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what casting off means in the first folio in a moment. Um, in terms of proofing, we think there was probably a proofing before printing, so once the type is set, they do, do a quick proof and read. But then there was proofing during print. And this is something that is uh, um, very typical in this period. Because that meant that as the pages were being printed, as the sheets were being printed, somebody was reading and checking. And if there was a need for a correction, they'd stop the press, they'd unlock the type, they'd change the uh, text, and then continue printing. But they didn't discard what had been printed. Unless there was, uh, there are a couple of cases where it's very egregious and they do, but generally speaking, they wouldn't. And so that means that um, in the case of the first folio, we know that there were at least a hundred, it stopped at least a hundred times to, to those changes. And because of the way that they fall, we've yet to find two copies of the first folio that are absolutely identical. So the thing that you're used to, which is you pick up a, a book in Toppings or Mr. B's, and if somebody else picks up another copy from the shelf, you know that they're identical if they're the same publisher. In the early modern period, you were much, much more used to the idea that there would be variation. And as I've said already, because of Troilus and Cressida, there's actually copies that don't even have an entire play in, uh, 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 included in that copy. Um, we know also we have there are five copies of the first folio that have proofing marks. And those, any of you who've worked in publishing, they are exactly the same as they are. Uh, we use nowadays you know, deletions and steps, all those kind of things. Um, uh, they're really quite uh, quite moving to see those. Um, this is what a page looks like in, uh, and you'll see it. Um, you would have seen it. The boys of you have seen the uh, the handouts. Um, so these are easy to read. A double double columns, which obviously allows or um, otherwise you'd, you'd either have to go for very large type or uh, lots of white space. So it's quite crammed. Um, they're ruled uh, and uh, you've got a page number on the top, which um, if any of you want to play a parlor game, um, you can see if you can uh, spot the many, many pagination errors in the first folio, partly because they restart the number. 
Um, but there are, um, that's why in the first value, you should never cite by page number because there could be two or three of those page numbers in there, um, which is why right at the bottom, you can't really see it. Is this strange? You'll have seen it on the handouts as they're going around. Um, uh, this little symbol, you still occasionally get it in very modern books now, but more sophisticated now, but uh, a letter and a number. And that is uh, uh, a printer's only bit of code called the signature, which allows uh, the uh, uh, printer to keep track of the sheets as they're being printed, regardless of the patient. Um, so with those stop press, press corrections, this is an example of one. Um, and uh, so you'll see that uh, on the left hand side, um, there are two lines that get missed out. Um, and, and so that's the kind of thing that gets stopped. You can stop the press, go, oh gosh, we're gonna move this around. Um, they, uh, uh, they're able to take the type from here and move it to the previous form, which is a form of type, which is not, I can imagine there was a certain degree of cursing because they'd have to then unlock two pieces, uh, two um, sets of type. And then these two lines being added here. So then that's a very typical uh, um, example. I also mentioned casting off, and I, those of you who came to the lecture I gave about history of the book will have seen some of these examples already. But remember, casting off is that judgment about how much space, where do the ends of the pages uh, uh, fall? And if you do it fine, you don't notice. But when you mess up, you end up with, oh, we just have to squeeze. So you see there's not much white space above uh, second scene there. Exeunt is on the same page. This one is even more uh, desperate. Um, running out. Um, so you can see there's meant to be at least two stage, stage directions there and finish. And so they squeeze that in as much as uh, uh, they can. Uh, um, and here is the reverse. More space, plenty of space. You need to uh, uh, fill it out. And um, then a couple of other examples. Here is. Uh, um, this is what happens when iambic pentameter meets a compositor who needs to fill some space. And we develop a new metrical style, 2.5 uh, 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 iambic. Um, and then this, and this is not me who've identified this as other scholars, but um, King Lear, which does exist in an earlier printed edition. If you look at the, uh, uh, you know, I'm a very foolish, fond old man, a very famous line in Lear. Uh, um, four score and upward. In the earlier edition, it goes four score, you're upward. I fear I am not in my perfect mind. There are two lines there that, is, that appear and they don't add anything. And the view is that actually this may have been a compositor looking to fill out. So this may seem like heresy, but compositor was prepared to do whatever it took to uh, 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 get a uh, page uh, filled. <laughs> okay, what about the costs? So I'm conscious I have uh, the chair of the finance subcommittee for the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution in the room. So this slide is for him. Um, uh, print run, so you all know about print runs, that's how many copies of an edition. So one of those things that in my field is the most commonly asked question and the answer is for in nearly all cases in this period, we just don't know. No account books survive for the London book trade. Um, the history of OUP, Oxford University Press, the volume I edited, um, there are some records there from the latest uh, um, uh, 17th century, same for Cambridge. But in London, we just don't know. So we have to make some educated guesses. And we think 750 copies is, 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 is likely. But it could have been more, it could have been less. Publishing is a risky business because it does something that, uh, um, I mean, in some ways it's, it's, it's a very pure form of capitalism because you invest upfront and you have to make a guess about how well something is likely to sell because you can't sell the first copy until you've finished everything. It's not like making bread or shoes where you can uh, 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 make one and sell one. You're gonna make 750 copies, you have to print 750 copies before you can sell that first and so you've got to get a lot of money up front and you've got to be able to judge the uh, uh, the market and there are plenty of publishers who get it wrong 
Um, we think the cost per copy to make, not to sell, to make was six shillings, eight pence, um, of which half at least was the cost of the paper. Paper was very expensive as a form of production and half uh, um, on the printing itself. Um, so if you do the maths, 250 pounds, which is a very large scale to produce. We think it probably sold wholesale within the trade for 10 shillings and retail for 15 shillings unbound, or if you want it bound, somewhere between 16 shillings and a pound, depending on what quality binding you wanted. That means the break even point was between 350 and 500 copies. So between 50 to two thirds of the print run, which is on the high side. And the big question is, we don't know whether it was a success or a failure. There's evidence both ways. Blount himself was quite a successful publisher, um, but he doesn't do anything for about five years afterwards. So that suggests that he may have run out of money. Equally, the second edition appears within nine years, which compared to some other uh, um, uh, large publications is actually faster. The most it's a big book it takes a while publishers are used to things not moving quickly but and it may well be that it was a very fine line between uh, uh, success or failure there but it was an expensive book and a lot of money up front okay my last uh, run of slides um before we uh, uh finish up so the book we had the publishers the syndicates you've seen how the book goes through the press and then we've seen that it's got to sell. And how do you sell something like this? Now, for you, this is not, you know, there's a Shakespeare society. We don't need to sell Shakespeare anymore. But in 1623, Shakespeare had been dead for seven years. There'd been some single editions of his plays, but, you know, it wasn't particularly uh, uh, newfangled. Um, and you were about to publish an expensive volume. And there weren't many. Uh, um, playwrights who had, uh, con as it was, contemporary playwrights who had had their works published in a collected works. Ben Johnson had done that with his plays and poetry in 1616, and then Shakespeare in 1623. So this is this is a risk. There's no there's no obvious market. Blount must have felt there was, um, but. If you look at the to the great variety of readers, so this is the text from the editors, Hemings and, Con, Hemings and Condor, and um, this is the opening. So it's not a case of, you know, you'll notice here, there's no mention of Shakespeare in that first paragraph. This is all about buying. So it talks about for the most able, to read to him that can spell. I don't think people who were barely literate would read this, but there you are numbered. We had rather you were weighed, early modern wit, especially when the fate of all books depends on your capacities and not of your heads alone, but of your purses. Well, it is now public, you will stand for your privileges, we know, to read and censure. Do so very light. We, we're happy for you to criticize and read, but buy it first. <laughs> that doth best commend a book, the stationer says. Uh, and however odd soever your brains be, or your wisdoms, make your license the same and spare not. Judge your sixpence, your shillings worth, your five shillings worth, etc. And welcome. But whatever you do, buy. I think you're getting the message there. The other thing that is in this uh, um, uh, preface to the great variety of readers, which actually is the bit that has come down to us. And there's probably more than anything else in the first folio has created a kind of mythology about the first folio is this line here. As where before you were abused with diverse, stolen and surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that exposed them, even those are now offered to your view, cured and perfect of their limbs and all the rest absolute in their numbers as he, Shakespeare, conceived them. What that is saying in a very blunt way is 
You know those play texts that you've been reading of Shakespeare's? They were stolen. They were surreptitious. They were maimed. In other words, they were not properly, uh, uh, they were um, imperfect in some sense and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious imposters. Now, it's somewhat interesting because not only do the publishers of this own uh, nine plays that have already been published before, but also all the other the other half of the plays have been appeared have appeared before, and they've had to sign the agreements with those publishers. So, so this is uh, um, if this was meant uh, uh, honestly, I think the publishers would have walked away. This is clearly an attempt at being able to make the case, which is true whenever a new edition of a work comes out. Throw away the old edition. You want this edition. This is the better. It's the most authorized. It's uh, uh, um, the edition you want. So in other words, these, this brings together the plays cured and perfect of their limbs, absolutely in their numbers. So that has made, uh, um, that makes the case for the first folio of presenting texts as Shakespeare uh, uh, conceived them. But it is excessive marketing uh, uh, language. Um, but the idea of diverse stolen self-tissue copies has been uh, um, affected how a lot of readers and editors have uh, um, interpreted uh, the, um, uh, and edited the plays from there on. The last few slides, the legacy of the first folio. Now, the first is really simple and is quite jaw dropping. If this work, this publication did not exist, I remember Shakespeare wasn't around. So if his friends, former colleagues, had not been able to uh, uh, drive a bargain with those uh, publishers, and those publishers hadn't uh, 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 agreed that there was a, uh, um, a possibility to make some money here, 18 plays of Shakespeare would not be passed down to us. They only exist because they exist in the first folio. And these are not minor plays. You know, the Tempest, Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, um, Taming of the Shrew, uh, Twelfth Night, um, As You Like It, Comedy of Edwards, Mirrors of Medicine, Measure uh, for Measure. Um, these are some, you know, the, the, some of these are the plays that we very much associate with, with Shakespeare and his, his style, and they would have been lost because we have no manuscripts with one very partial exception. We have no manuscripts for Shakespeare. So if it weren't for this publication, we'd have uh, far fewer plays uh, to read. Um, what other things can we say from the first folio? One of them is the, the stationer's register. So that entry and the entries for the other plays, those determined who could and couldn't shape, publish Shakespeare until the 1770s. They were considered to be property within the trade. They were sold, they were divided, they were inherited, they were uh, um, uh, given as loans, they were they moved around the trade. And by the time you get to the 1770s, there are publishers who will have you know, tiny fractions of the collected works of Shakespeare. So every time somebody publishes uh, the collected works, they get their little bit of uh, return. Um, and it's not until the 1770s that Shakespeare goes into what we've now considered to be the public domain. Um, second edition, so-called second folio. These are terms not used at the time. They're uh, um, used by collectors later. Published in 1632, no new plays added, but some commendatory poems are new, including by one John Milton. Third edition has seven new plays of which only one, Pericles, is uh, 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 one we consider to be Shakespeare's. Uh, those of you online don't have the handout, but I put it on the handout. The other plays that are included, uh, um, Locrine, uh, The London Prodigal, The Puritan, St John at Oldcastle, Thomas Lord Cromwell, and A Yorkshire Tragedy. Um, so these are plays that uh, um, are associated with Shakespeare, but we do not believe are Shakespeare's. Um, one of the more, uh, 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 one of the interesting stories about the first folio's uh, subsequent history is that the Bodleian Library in Oxford, once the third edition comes out, new, with extra plays, they get rid of the first edition, like any good library does, um, and, uh, uh, and buy the third folio. And it's only in the 19, uh, early 20th century that they publish it, uh, they uh, purchase it back. 
And it's only in the 18th century that editing of Shakespeare's plays properly in the sense that we would understand it now begins. And then um, my last slide. Um, so the first failure is not rare. It's very important, it's very expensive, but it's not rare. We think there are about 230, 240 known copies uh, out there in circular, um, you know, in private hands in, in uh, uh, libraries and so on. Um, so that's about a third. Um, I, I have books on my sh bookshelf. I know surviving fewer co copies from the same period or a little later. So it's, uh, um, it's not rare, partly because <clears throat> it's not an easy book to lose. Um, and so, you know, rarity tends to be for smaller books, which uh, um, fall apart easily or, or not preserved. By the end of the, towards the end of the 18th century, we start getting, uh, and there's a longer story about this, uh, an interest in collecting Shakespeare's uh, first folio. And by the 1770s, it becomes very common for uh, uh, collectors, not sure, I'm sure no collector in this room would do it now, uh, to, to break up a defective copy to create a perfect copy. So you've got two defective copies and you take one apart and then you go, oh, I've now got a complete one. Um, and so that makes it a little difficult to know exactly how many real copies survive, but we guess that probably somewhere approaching 300 copies for which there are at least some parts survive, but some of those copies have now become, uh, two copies have become one. Um, the largest collection is held by the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, which uh, holds over 80 copies. And many of these uh, copies have been digitized. One of the things that, um, particularly in the last five, six years or so, an enormous number of these uh, um, first values have been digitized. Uh, and you know, freely available whether it's in British Library, Bodleian in Oxford, Cambridge, uh, uh, Folger, uh, wherever. So it's so much easier when I was undergraduate to be able to see what the first folio would have looked like um, would have meant going to um, a library that had the Hinman. Uh, now you can see uh, um, a multiple number of copies uh, uh, digitally. I'm going to leave it there. We've got, as it were, from not quite to the iPad, but close. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions, but uh, um, I, hope, I hope that's been interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank answer that now no they're not no 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 so there are there are copies uh, at the British Library uh, copies in Cambridge mm -hmm. copies in Oxford uh, uh, copies uh, across the world and there are copies in private hands as well thank you um, the other fact was that um, the Shakespeare Library in Oxford was the
so so um so the, the, your rights, the, the second part of your uh, premise, though, is clearly the case that actors had, as they uh, um, often do today, a, a certain degree of uh, um, liberty when they're on the stage. There was a, there was a script, but the, the script existed in a rather different form to the way we'd understand it now. Uh, uh, actors would have their, their bits and they would know their cue lines. There might be a, there, there might be a full... Uh, uh, manuscripts, sort of master copies. Um, however, that may have uh, um, differed on the night. You know, the version that was was uh, um, uh, delivered on stage could vary considerably. There is also, and this was subject to a lot of um, scholarly debate in the 80s, which um, still affects uh, some editing of Shakespeare. No, 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 the 1980s. So the 1980s. Um, so I'll give you the example, the most uh, um, important, obvious example is King Lear. So King Lear, uh, we'd have no manuscripts from it, for it. There was obviously a manuscript on the stage, but with no manuscripts survived. It appears in two editions, 1608 and then 1623. They're quite different in places. Um, and for years, uh, editors have either taken the, what was said by the uh, Hemings and Condal on the screen there about the early temple being so surreptitious and stolen, um, and preferred the first folio edition, or they conflated and they took what they thought were the best parts of the folio and the best parts of the quarto and combined them. In the 1980s, the argument was made, and it's it is it, it's uh, um, it's not completely uh, um, accepted, but it's it's very uh, um, it does shape some editions. These are two versions of King, Lear, and that one was closer to the theatrical version, and then the other is a revised version that may never have been put on, but actually may have been the version that Shakespeare himself revised. Um, and so rather than trying to combine the two, the in the 1980s, this is the Oxford edition of Shakespeare's works, it included both versions as if they were separate texts, separate plays. Um, so, um, so you're right, but there is, it's always very difficult to look at a play on the page, and this is true whether it's Johnson, Shakespeare, whoever in the early modern period, um, indeed, most playwrights, with some exceptions, um, and to say this is exactly how those words, these are the words that would have been delivered on stage. Um, and we also believe with some of Shakespeare's works that there were revisions made, possibly because of revivals, possibly because of uh, um, you know, a later version that was revised uh, that wasn't then staged. So it is, it is difficult, it's about a very long-winded way of saying that it's we can't assume that the text that we read in the first folio is exactly as it would have appeared on the stage, uh, um, particularly when it was first staged. Also, again, which the the, um, the first folio, what the first folio does, and you know this as a, as a uh, society of Shakespeare. Shakespeare was a man of the theatre. And any of you who've worked in theatre know that it has to be collaborative. Um, and, and we know that many, many playwrights in the early modern period, and why Shakespeare would be exceptional on this, I don't, I don't think he would have been, worked with other playwrights. You know, they wrote together. One person took one scene, one took another scene. Um, or they, they revised together. And so the idea that it is Shakespeare alone's words that we read in the first folio, which is what it appears because his name is there and his pictures on the title page, actually in the reality of the theatre, I think is rather different. So I think you said you have a third question, which I hope you're quite quick. It's really uh, interesting that um, what these four Shakespeare is actually a collaborative work in a way. You know, there's that famous classical guy, contemporary of um, Shakespeare, who claimed that he was Shakespeare. Uh, but I think he died here in Shakespeare, right? Um, so basically, with, you know, there are versions, 
of Shakespeare, uh, from what I gather from what you said. Mm -hmm. There's no authenticity as to whether it was stuff Shakespeare or whether it was not as well. It's difficult to be able to distinguish. I mean, there's, there's a degree and there's a lot of analysis of style, which I think some of that has worked very well in being able to distinguish particular playwrights' style. Um, but evidently, you know, Macbeth, for example, if you look at the latest Oxford edition of Macbeth, it, I think the title page reads something like, written by uh, uh, William Shakespeare with revisions by Thomas Middleton. So, so there is there's an element in which uh, that, that that there is that kind of collaborative nature. So, uh, any other question? Um, obviously, I don't need a lot of questions. Could I ask you to confine yourself to one question? My <laughs> gentleman with David. That's a very enjoyable talk. Thank you. Um, I actually know anything about the report. When you were talking about the report, you were talking about the report. When you were talking about the report, you were talking about the report. When you were talking about the report, you were talking about the report. When you were talking about the report, you were talking about the report. When you were talking about the report, you were talking about the report. It would, your, yes, your, your assumption is that this, this would, we start with literacy level. In this period, probably about if, if we were a cross section of early modern London, one in four of the men in this room could read, one in 10 of the women could read. So, you know, straight away, you've got a fairly small uh, uh, proportion. And then you um, uh, combine that with, I'm trying to get to the title page here so we can have the title page. Um, combine that with the cost, although generally speaking, literary people would tend to be wealthier because they'd have had that education or means of um, uh, being educated. Do you know a little bit about uh, um, who bought it? Because amongst those 200 plus copies, um, uh, some their, uh, 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 the names in it, um, some remained you know, very clear provenance lines. I brought a couple of books with me, which are on the handout as well. Um, this Cambridge Companion to Shakespeare's First Folio, which has a, a aimed at undergraduates, very readable. It has uh, um, uh, a section in here about collectors, so that's later readers. Um, this First Folio of Shakespeare, uh, produced by Peter Blaney, this has um, uh, quite a few examples of um, copies where we see names, where there's at least one copy where Jaggard himself gifted the copy, so we see uh, uh, Jagged's own um, uh, name on the uh, flyleaf. Um, we, of course, and I, you know, I wouldn't assume this was the case in this room, but it's perfectly possible to buy the first folio of Shakespeare and not read it. Um, so, uh, so, you know, when we say readers, um, we can have people who buy books and don't read them, but equally have plenty of people who read books who might not buy them. We also know, um, that a book like this might have been rented out. So there's no public libraries in this uh, um, in this period, but there does seem to be a mechanism that some booksellers uh, uh, used to rent out books by the week. Um, so you know, a way of earning a bit of money for, for somebody who, you know, a poor student who might be desperate to read but can't afford the whole book. Um, so, uh, um, so we know a little bit about the readers, but not a huge amount. Thank you very much. Um, I assume that is a folio that made the categories of, of the history of um, How much in fostering, as it were, did it folio do itself or folio actually? I'm thinking particularly of the titles that Shakespeare made and that haven't been quite faithful here. One is um, Henry VIII, um, who has Shakespeare called that flawless crew. And he thinks, as you said, so he reads the play. Whereas the life and times of Henry VIII, I just don't. So they seem to have taken liberties. So, yes, well, um, so some of this, 
let's take the genre question first. So the genre, uh, the layout and the grouping of genres is clearly it's 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 a, a uh, the first photo is the first to group them in this way, um, and it's the first to create this category of histories in which uh, um, works of English history are, are are included. So yes, that genre is 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 um, that generic approach is. Uh, um, defined by the editors. When it comes to the titles, now, so play titles are um, are interesting because um, if you look at an early modern title page, now the Shakespeare, I bring this one up partly because this is quite a short title page. Um, Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedy History of Tragedies published according to their true original copies. If you look at like something like um, publication of King Lear or uh, um, one of the Henry plays, the title is very long and it will include, it might not even mention his name. Early Shakespeare plays do not mention his name because his name was not significant. He wasn't known as a, as a writer. It was more important that the play had been produced and performed. So that was the thing, you know, as performed before Her Majesty or, or, or something like that. Um, but also bearing in mind that um, this isn't a bad example of this. You see this on a bookcase. This tells you nothing. It's a big, hefty, green bound book um, and early bound copies similarly would have had nothing on the front or back. Um, and we're very used to the idea of a title, you know, cover uh, and uh, blurb on the back. So if you were trying to sell, you know, trying to say there's a new uh, um, printed edition, whether it's First Folio or Hamlet as a single edition or whatever, you would use the title page and um, oh, let's go forward. Um, you'd have taken the title page separately and put that up as if it was a poster. So you want the title page to have as much information as possible because that was your advertisement. So the title page was an advertisement, which is why you then tend to have these quite long title pages because they want to give you as much information as possible, particularly if you didn't know much about the story, to try and hook you in, whether it was to do with where it was played, whether it had a particular actor in it, um, uh, or if it had multiple titles. So, so the titles that, sh that, sh that have come down to us, some of those are the consequence of later scholars determining how we should describe that play. Doesn't necessarily mean that was how that play was understood by uh, or known by its audience, or indeed by people who would uh, um, buy that copy or uh, look for it in the, uh, uh, the first folio. Uh, I think, gentlemen, I've got another Yes, yes, I did. Yes, yes. <coughs> Martin, microphone, microphone. Thank you, sir. You mentioned, I believe, the introduction to authorize. What sort of rule you maintain according to which a writer or author would be expected to signify his agreement? or permission or this or that work the copy reproduced for what you will by third parties short answer short answer no it was perfectly possible in this period for a work to be printed without the author's consent um what happened what, there are cases where uh, um, authors get very irate about this, um, but there's no legal remedy. Um, there is a sense in which a manuscript in itself is um, like any other object. So if you have a, a manuscript copy of a text and you decide to get that copied or to sell it to a bookseller or publisher, then you th th that's a legal transaction. That's fine. They go and they can uh, uh, do with it what what they wish. Whoever the author, original author of that, has no legal remedy. Um, obviously, and this does clearly prevent it in certain cases, if they are a very uh, um, powerful aristocrat or whatever, then it's a different matter. Um, in practice, we think that most booksellers probably, probably wanted to keep on the side of, of authors. But when it comes to something like Shakespeare, and this goes back to the original questions about um, you know, collaborative. Any of you who've worked for a company and had to produce written material will know that your copyright in that material is actually 
not yours, it is the company. And in a theatrical world where copyright in the sense we understand it doesn't exist, there's a question mark of to what extent somebody, an individual in a theatre company could rightly claim that they, rather than the company, owns any manuscripts. So what we, we're pretty sure that when Shakespeare's plays get published uh, um, in single editions, for the most part, that's the company, not the individual, the company, the theatre company, selling the manuscript to a printer or publisher to earn some extra money for the company. Um, so the idea, the modern idea now that, you know, there's an individual author who has uh, um, the rights over their written work and they ultimately can say whether something is published or not. In this period, particularly for plays, it's, it's, it's a very different world. It's a very different world. Thank you. One more question. <clears throat> Um, I was wondering, is there any evidence or can you surmise from um, Shakespeare's own writings that he had any um, particular interest or familiarity with the printing and publishing trade? And did he incorporate any of the printers of jargon, technical jargon, uh, into language and metaphor? It's a really good question, really good question. We, um, I'll take the, the first part. Uh, uh, first, which is uh, um, the more straightforward, we we have no evidence that Shakespeare himself um, was interested in the printing of his plays. His poems, yes, Venus and Adonis, probably one of his most uh, popular plays. He writes the uh, uh, dedication and preface. We we we're pretty sure that he is involved in the um, you know, he sanctions and worked with the publisher in that case. The plays, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that. Um, and we know that for two reasons. One, because there's no, there's never any, sorry, there's never any dedicatory information, nothing in the front of the plays that comes from Shakespeare. Um, his name doesn't always appear on the title pages in the early uh, publications. And also, if we look at someone like Ben Johnson, one of his uh, um, contemporaries becomes something of a rival, obviously writes the most famous commendatory poem in the first poem to the memory of uh, Shakespeare. Um, he is unusual because he is so interested in printing and publishing, and he takes a lot of care over how his works appear in print. And we see that both in the individual works, but particularly in the collective works, which appear during his life. Johnson is all over, he's there checking, proofing and so on. And we can see also that he thinks about how his plays will look on the page. Um, Shakespeare and language. Now, I'm pretty sure he loves books. So there's a lot of references to books and to reading in Shakespeare's plays. Um, but in terms of the inside of a printing house, there's stuff about ink, but that's, you know, that's not necessarily to do with printing. Um, I can't think of any uh, examples where he shows specific knowledge of what goes on in a printing house in a way that would suggest, unlike, say, Ben Johnson, that he'd been a, uh, uh, had been inside and, and took a particular interest in, uh, uh, in it. Um, so, you know, there are no metaphors around printing type, uh, nothing there about, I mean, some of the language, some of the language obviously is also metaphorical language, so form, form of type is also, uh, form is a very uh, um, literary, uh, it's a very rich word, um, but I can't think of any to do with um, language of printing presses. Um, there's sometimes about pressing, but of course there are plenty of other presses, not just printing press. Um, so, uh, do you, can you think of one? Uh, Chase is a printing term, but I would have thought the, the phrase is not a printing term. Um, so uh, um, the the chase is a particular part of the printing press. Um, so I don't think there's a, an example of, of of that I can think of. Um, which, I, yeah, so I'd say Shakespeare he's he's very interested in theatre, very interested in theatre. You know, a lot of his plays play with the language of theatre and games about theatre, and he loves putting plays inside plays, that kind of thing. Um, and about books and writing, less about 
printing. I, don't, I can't think of any off, off, off the top of my head. I will now go back and start searching for frisky and tinker and all sorts of strange words. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Going to the uh, privilege now. Well, that this is the first time we've had a speaker, the first time in my memory anyway, we've had a speaker talking about the, the technical processes that go on to produce a book. And this is a very important book, absolutely fascinating. I do thank you very much indeed. For, for that. <laughs>